forum that you are hosting. But uh, but when Grace asked me to do this, I uh, I thought I was just going to be on a panel, and then uh, and then Jackie sent me uh, the the flyer showing that I was a keynote speaker, and then I freaked out. So um, so hopefully uh, we'll be able to get through the information uh, that that. Um, that was shared with me that you would like covered. Uh, it's going to be a, a little bit dense, and uh, and I'm going to move quickly because there were so many things that um, that you guys wanted to discuss uh, that uh, each of them could easily be a presentation in and of itself. So um, with that said, I guess I will share my screen. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Okay, I think. Okay, so let me know if uh, if you can all see that, or I get. Hopefully, you can all see that. Um, okay. Uh, okay, great. I see the thumbs up. Perfect. All right. So uh, let's see. Uh, let me see if I can move this out of the way so it's not. Uh, there we. Go. That's not going anywhere. Okay, well, hopefully that won't make a, a difference here. All right, so uh, you have invited me today and the main topic was supposed to be uh, to discuss regional transportation planning. Um, and uh, as it was stated, I am Christian Horvath and I am a city council member in Redondo Beach. Uh, just to correct uh, one thing that uh, Joan mentioned, I, I am not a former mayor. I'm a former mayor pro tem in, in the city of Redondo Beach. We have an at-large mayor and uh, they serve uh, a, a full four-year term. So um, let me see here. Uh, okay, so uh, th these are some of the things that were mentioned about me, uh, and you see it there. I, I do always list, I think, the most important titles first, that I, I am a husband and a dad and, and a volunteer, and, and I think, uh, as you'll see by the list of, uh, by the list of roles that I have served in the past six years that I have a problem saying no, um, especially when there's a compelling reason not to say no. And so, um, so I, I have been honored to serve in, in all of these capacities. And, uh, you know, I believe that diving into the deep end on policy issues that are complex is super important um, it, for elected leaders to really um, take an active role in figuring out where are we going? Um, wh what is the point of serving in an elected position unless you are thinking down the line, unless you are thinking forward? And so one of my, uh, one of my tenets has been to really take a, a long-term approach to uh, policy and things that'll have a dramatic effect, not only on, on me, but really, uh, and the whole reason I ran is on my children, right? They're going to inherit uh, everything. Um, and I don't mean inherit from me. I mean, they're going to inherit the quality of life that we have. And I think it's in our best interest to ensure that we are preserving a quality of life, a safe and healthy world for uh, our children and their children and whatnot. So, um, and then if anybody wants to contact me, there's some contact information there at the bottom. Uh, so what are we going to discuss today? Um, uh, these are some of the things that, uh, uh, that I was asked to cover. So we're going to talk about the role of governments and organizations like SCAG and the South Bay City Council of Governments. Uh, we're going to touch base on the regional transportation plan, the what, how, and the why. Uh, we're going to talk about sub-regional strategies. Um, one of them being the local travel network. And then I'm gonna just end with a, a very, very brief overview on housing. And then we can always, uh, you know, in a Q and A, uh, try to go a little bit deeper than that. So um, <clears throat> you are, should hopefully uh, all be aware of this, but this is our US government structure, right? We have a federal government, uh, then we have state government, county government. And then uh, squeezed in between county and local government is regional or sub-regional um, government. And it's, it's not necessarily government uh, as much as it are, they are agencies, joint power authorities that have uh, some direct effect on uh, all those other levels of government in one way or another. Um, and so we're gonna cover two organizations uh, that are important to us. Uh, the first one is SCAG, and that is the Southern California Association of Governments. Um, when I got elected, 
I, uh, Jackie Bacharach, uh, who is the executive director of the South Bay COG, uh, came and, and met with me. And, and uh, I, I realized in that moment that I really wanted to be a part of that organization. Um, she, she really sold it. And, uh, and I really saw the potential in what that means, not only for the city of Redondo Beach, but for our subregion as a whole. Um, the one organization I didn't get involved in until just this past year really is SCAG, and they're a, a much uh, larger organization. So they are a joint powers authority um, under federal law. They are designated as a metropolitan planning organization. And, um, and then under California law, they are seen as a regional transportation planning organization and a COG. Um, so SCAG is quite large. It covers six counties, Imperial, Los Angeles, Ontario, Riverside, San Bernardino, and Ventura. Within that are 14 subregions, uh, which are considered uh, the COGS, the Council of Governments. And then, uh, and then that is 100, they represent 191 cities. So covering 38,000 square miles. So it's a large organization. And as you can imagine, you know, there are a lot of interests uh, and diverse interests coming from that area. So uh, the needs of somebody in Imperial County are gonna be very different than the needs of someone in Los Angeles County. Um, so what does SCAG do? Um, so they do quite a bit um, and, and they are coordinating with the state and with our COGS and, and our local uh, member cities. Um, but uh, the things I've listed here are, are just uh, kind of a, a bullet point, you know, summary of what they do. So they maintain a continuous comprehensive and coordinated planning process resulting in a regional transportation plan, which is we'll call the RTP and federal transportation improvement program, which we call the FTIP. Um, they develop sustainable community strategies, uh, and that's primarily to address greenhouse gas emissions um, as an element of the RTP. They develop demographic uh, projections, integrated land use, housing, employment, transportation programs, and strategies for the SQAMD. Um, and all this information, by the way, is fully accessible by you or anybody else, but clearly also used uh, and is important for organizations like the COG and or each of the cities. Um, they are a co-lead agency for air quality, uh, and, and they do that in conjunction with the Central Coast and the Southeast, uh, Southeast Desert Air Bases and Districts. Um, and then they are responsible for developing and ensuring that the RTP and the FTIP conform to the purposes of the state implementation plans for specific transportation related criteria pollutants per the Clean Air Act. Um, they review EIRs for projects um, that have regional significance. Um, they develop an area-wide waste treatment management plan. They are responsible for the preparation of the regional housing needs assessment, which we'll touch on a little bit later. And then along with uh, the San Diego Association of Governments in Santa Barbara County cities, uh, they are responsible for a hazardous waste management plan. So yeah, it's a lot. Um, so uh, let's see here, next. Um, all right, so what is sub-regional government? So clearly it's neither local nor regional. Um, it's closer to the member cities, uh, voluntary, uh, voluntary, collaborative, and flexible. Uh, they handle coordinated action and professional representation. It's a single point of contact for policy programs and funding opportunities. It reflects the needs, interests, and physical conditions of member cities, and they perform strategic planning responsibilities from the state and region. And so now what is a COG? Um, it's a council of governments, um, not a new level of bureaucracy. And it's a forum in which city leaders can collaborate to create efficiencies and, and leverage <laughs> solutions to lobby state, federal, um, and other resources for funds or, or needs. And, uh, and it builds consensus for planning at the higher, highest levels. Now, when I mentioned that, you know, Jackie came and, and you know, presented to me when, 
what I saw then and what I still see now and why I, I firmly believe in the mission of, of our South Bay City Council of Governments is because we really work in a highly collaborative fashion to have a dramatic impact on the South Bay area. Um, and in many ways, cities are sometimes cash strapped. You know, we can only do so much with the budgets that we have. But each of us are faced with very similar challenges. And so there are many situations where by combining our efforts, by working together, um, pooling our resources, we can actually save monies as cities, but still achieve um, a, a greater benefit to whatever it is we're trying to work on. And I'll get more into that. So within Los Angeles County, there are multiple COGS uh, and you'll see them listed here. Um, and there's a, a little map there showing you them. Now, uh, the one here on this map, which I got from a local organization, they do have uh, North Los Angeles County listed there within the map, but that is not, uh, to my knowledge, a, a designated COG. Um, and each of these COGs, by the way, even though they are separate and distinct, some have many cities, some have a handful of cities, they communicate. The executive directors from these organizations communicate um, at least once a month. And we are always looking for ways to collaborate uh, and ensure that the message, the needs of the COGS and or the cities that they represent are getting communicated to our county leaders and or our state leaders. Here within uh, the South Bay COG, and since many of you uh, in the Tri-League uh, probably live in these cities, uh, you'll see there are 16 cities within the South Bay COG. And then we also have um, a representative from uh, each of the two county districts that overlay into the South Bay. So uh, Supervisor Mitchell's district and uh, Supervisor Hans district are each part of the South Bay. So each of these cities has a representative, uh, which currently right now for Redondo Beach is myself uh, and an alternate. And we as a body, as a board come together and then, uh, and then make decisions and take action. Um, so the South Bay COGS core roles, there's, I'm gonna talk about three core roles. The first one is we are really a laboratory for innovation. And you know, I will give uh, all of that credit to Jackie Bacharach and her staff. Um, you know, Jackie started this organization 20 some odd years ago. Um, she's a former elected official herself and, um, and really just has an enormous amount of energy and foresight in realizing like, what do we need to focus on? And so I, I just have a true amount of appreciation and gratitude for her and her leadership. Um, and all these things you see listed here, there, there's more than that, but these are, are some of the more high level areas that we, we try to focus on and try to create policy on because they do, as I mentioned previously, overlap into each of the municipalities. Um, we also, our second core role is that we are uh, a conduit for equitable funding allocations. So as I mentioned, each of the cities uh, is always looking for funding opportunities for programs. That's exactly what the COG is doing in collaboration with the cities. Um, some of them are transportation uh, related. So you'll see Measure R and Measure M, those were sales tax initiatives. Um, you'll see Measure H, another sales tax initiative for homelessness. And then we also work with, um, with other agencies um, uh, or organizations uh, in terms of like programs like our Green Business Assist program or Cash for Kitchens, energy rebates. Uh, we are always looking for ways to, uh, to help cities save money, make improvements, and also at, at the same time, take steps forward in the, in the policy areas, especially as it relates to the environment that we have set. And then our, our third core role is to function as a, a communication network. And that is a, a communication network between all of the uh, member cities, but not just the elected officials. Um, the COG organizes meetings for the city managers. Uh, they meet monthly, the community development directors, the economic development directors, um, our public works directors and engineers. Um, so there's a lot going on in this organization uh, and, and it is meant to be um, 
uh, a, an enormous resource to all the cities. And they have the option you know, as to how much they want to engage or not engage uh, the cities. Uh, and I think the ones that engage probably see the most benefit. Um, and then we take it one step further because we are the kind of intermediary to agencies like Metro or Caltrans. The cities can work, uh, of course, with those agencies directly too, but, um, but in many cases, uh, the South Bay COG is, is kind of a, a go-between uh, where necessary, and I think it provides a, a great function and resource, as previously mentioned. So that was a mouthful, and we're, we're not even like halfway through the presentation. Um, there is more, but that, that kind of gives us a good overlay of, of the governmental structure and, and what the COG and SCAG is. So now we're going to move into the regional transportation um, uh, planning aspect. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show this video here that um, SCAG put out when they were in the development process of Connect SoCal, which is, uh, is the regional transportation plan for 2020 to 2040. So we'll watch this and then, and then we'll move on. Southern California is a region that has seen tremendous growth together as the six counties of Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, San Bernardino, Imperial, and Ventura, we're the 15th largest economy in the world. Oh, oh, and we're the nation's entertainment capital. We're also home to the busiest trade ports and the largest manufacturing center in the nation. Clothes, sriracha, rockets, and satellites. Since 2000. Ooh, Y2K. We've added 2.3 million people, but also 2.1 million cars. One of the outcomes has been traffic. We now spend more than 100 hours sitting in traffic each year. I'd rather be surfing or reading or doing yoga. Oh. Air quality has been getting worse and childhood asthma rates are increasing. Are we going back in time? Hey there, I've got clean air, only 50 cents. And housing is getting more expensive. Connect SoCal is a blueprint for the future. It's about how we envision a more sustainable Southern California 25 years from now. At the core of the plan are some strategies to help shape this future. Regional growth needs to be focused closer to job centers and mobility options. Live close to where you work. Sustainable development means not building in conservation areas, farmland, and areas prone to wildfires. To make housing more affordable and accessible, we need a wide variety of home types, not just single family homes or high rise apartment buildings and new funding mechanisms for cities to build housing infrastructure and transportation improvements. Advances in technology provide real-time traffic data and greater alternatives to driving. Like carpooling, walking, and biking. Accelerating investments in electrification will also help us substitute polluting cars and trucks with clean air vehicles. Other things the plan addresses include strengthening our transit system to give people greater access to high quality, high frequency transit options, improving traffic safety with neighborhood complete streets planning, and an emphasis on proper care and maintenance of our existing road network. Connect SoCal plan will increase mobility, improve quality of life, and help meet greenhouse gas reduction goals across the region. And create 167,000 new jobs. Our draft plan is now online, and you can learn more about it at connectsocal.org. Let us know what you think. Okay, so that gives you an idea of, of what the intent is for regional transportation planning. Um, really high level, uh, trying to think about where we're going and what we're going to need to make huge differences in, in transportation, uh, in, uh, in the planning sector, uh, and how those areas are going to affect our environment and quality of life. So as you see here on, on this slide, you know, what is included uh, within the plan, uh, visions, policies, performance measures, um, forecasts, those forecasts are for population growth, uh, household growth, employment, land use, um, a financial plan, um, because let's face it, you know, to do all of these things will cost an enormous amount of money. And so how are we going to pay for that? How are we going to make the investments necessary um, to, to see these um, ideas or visions to fruition? Um, it'll include a list of projects 
that are uh, anticipated to be initiated or completed by 2045. Um, and then you, there is analysis that focuses on areas like active transportation, aviation, environmental justice, goods movement, highways and arterials, land use, um, natural lands conservation, passenger rail and transit, public health, uh, transportation demand management, and safety and security. So it's a lot. Um, and, and really between the cities, SCAG, and the, and the Council of Governments, everybody is kind of working uh, together to try to figure out how do we effectuate um, these, these ideas. Um, and, and try to make them, you know, something that, that actually can come to fruition. Uh, so the, the plan uh, balances our future mobility and housing needs with economic, environmental, and public health goals. Um, the information in here and the ideas are developed and were developed from 2016 forward with the input from diverse stakeholders. So that does include um, organizations, cities, COGS, uh, you name it. Um, there are currently 4,000 transportation projects identified, which uh, look to cost uh, $638 billion. Um, but through SCAG and through this, they can also qualify for some federal funding. Um, so at the end of the day, these strategies are supposed to help our region. Uh, in, in a variety of ways, especially as it relates to lowering greenhouse gas emissions and, and uh, creating, uh, meeting the requirements for the Federal uh, Clean Air Act. Um, so how are projects selected? Um, early on in the planning process, SCAG asks that each of the six county transportation commissions, which are known as CTCs, submit updated project lists for inclusion. Um, the CTCs are responsible for adding, removing, or updating projects uh, based on jurisdictional needs. So what the COG does here in this situation is a lot of our projects that come through us, which I'll touch on uh, momentarily, um, go to Metro and then Metro in conjunction with the CTC, uh, those projects then potentially become eligible uh, for us. Uh, to, uh, if they're included within the, the SCAG RTP, they become eligible for uh, the FTIP uh, monies. So why do we need this? Um, again, we are thinking ahead and there's expectations that we're going to add nearly 4 million people in the next 25 years. So how do we accommodate that growth while at the same time maintaining quality of life? And if you look at the graphic here, this graphic is, is from SCAG and it just shows what the, um, what the demographics are anticipated to look like over the coming years. So you'll see uh, they see a growth in households from 5.9 million to 7.4 million. Um, they see growth in employment from 7.4 million to 9.9 million, and then population from 18.3 million to 22.1 million. Um, there are changes in ethnic composition of population. And then we also have to take into consideration that uh, many of our baby boomers are going to be uh, continuing to age and retire. And so what is that, you know, what, what kind of an effect does that have on um, economic development or on just the needs of baby boomers as they continue to age? Um, so SCAG's role, they are the lead agency in, in, this, uh, in this, this RTP. Um, they clearly try to understand the importance of input and consensus. Um, their staff is guided by the policy committee. SCAG has policy committees uh, for a variety of different areas. Um, and then of course, they rely on organizations like the South Bay COG, local governments and whatnot to provide information and ideas. Um, and the end result is a collaborative process. Um, so what is the South Bay COGS role within this? Um, so we are actually not considered a member agency at SCAG, um, which is frustrating and, and something Jackie and I were talking about in the past few days is, you know, that we would like to petition them to be because there is such a collaborative um, uh, process between the two organizations, but we don't necessarily 
uh, get a say uh, and, and a voice as a organization some, uh, most of the time. So uh, I think you know, that's something that we should try to correct uh, so that we are uh, at the table a little bit more as an organization. What the COG does not do is we don't implement projects typically, especially as it relates to the RTP. Uh, we rely on other um, organizations like Metro or Caltrans uh, or the local cities to implement the projects. We are more of a facilitator or like I said, a conduit for funding. Uh, what we do do is we bring ideas to the table. Um, we coordinate with our member agencies. We provide opportunities to present best practices and learning environments. Uh, we conduct an enormous amount of sub-regional research, um, which we share with both SCAG and with the state. Um, and then we, invite, we advise Metro on sub-regional transportation projects, uh, which are then, as I said, presented to SCAG as part of the RTP in order to be eligible for the FTIP funding. So you may find this all confusing, and it can be, and you know, we're going a little bit into the weeds here, but, but don't, don't worry. That's why there's uh, people like me and, and, and Jackie and, and our other elected officials and the staff members and all these organizations to try to help uh, work through this on your behalf. So if, uh, if we don't have a direct role at the SCAG level, how, do, how does the South Bay COG impact planning? And uh, it's primarily through these bullet points you see here, advocacy, working with our member agencies, promoting sub-regional projects and studies, and then working as a conduit to transportation funding. Um, so I'm going to list off some examples of projects that we have done. Uh, this first one here is near and dear to my heart uh, because it's something that uh, I got very engaged with right from the get-go uh, when I got on the COG. And this is really, um, again, a great example of thinking forward. Um, we talk a lot about transportation dollars and um, this project here, we were able to fund through Measure M, which was a 2016 sales tax measure. And what it does is it's the South Bay Fiber Network, which now uh, has been built out and connects all the cities, all the municipal agencies in the South Bay with gigabit uh, fiber that is faster, more secure and resilient. Um, it's gonna save each of the municipalities an enormous amount of money. And what it does is it really gives each of the cities a backbone if they want to expand municipal broadband out to their businesses uh, and their residents. Um, within their streets. Uh, it's, it really is a very forward thinking project. And from the perspective of the COG, one of the reasons we were able to secure Measure M transportation funding is that we were able to talk about the impacts on transportation. The idea that a fiber network and having people connected could potentially keep cars off the road has implications on transportation. And I'll touch base a little bit more on that. But you'll see the bullet point there, the focus on the trip not taken. We don't talk about it enough, but what we've seen during this past 18 months is how the trip not taken has an, a ginormous effect. We are right now having this meeting over Zoom. Um, and so we're not all getting in our cars and driving to the depot. Um, we're actually doing something that is having a positive impact, even if uh, we're, we're losing out on the, the ability to um, connect uh, in the physical sense, but we're having a positive impact on uh, greenhouse gases and, and um, just congestion on our roads. Um, in my opinion, the South Bay Fiber Network has implications for social equity, for economic development, transportation, uh, and public safety, just to name a few. Um, another example, uh, and the next two are, are uh, related to sales tax measures, Measure R and Measure M. Um, measure R is the uh, South Bay Highway Program. The point of Measure R was to try to relieve congestion on, uh, on the highways by making improvements on our arterials. Um, and so a lot of the projects you'll see sometimes in the South Bay, putting in right-hand turn lanes or expanding a road uh, is, is to create the ability for cars to move more freely and, and quickly. Uh, and that's what Measure R primarily focuses on. Um, and so as you see, as of 2020, we've completed more than 80 projects and studies. Uh, 
uh, and they are either in development under construction and should be delivered by 2025 at a cost of 412 million. Um, measure M, which was passed in 2016, actually uh, gives us a much broader window of projects that we can do. And, and this will lead into uh, the, when we talk about the, the local travel network. Um, it really allows cities uh, to focus on complete streets, um, which, which could lead to more bike lanes, um, uh, the greening up of, of street projects, um, green street projects. Um, so there are three different areas within this program uh, that the COG helps uh, that the COG helps uh, administer. And, uh, and right now, as of 2020, we have 44 projects in development or under construction uh, at a total cost of 180 million. This program goes on, will go on for quite a while. Uh, there is a sunset uh, somewhere down the line, but uh, that can always be changed. So uh, you're gonna see most of the programs that your cities and or the COG focuses on in coming years are coming out of the Measure M program. We have our South Bay Sustainable Network Neighborhood Strategy. Um, this was developed by the COG and adopted by the board. Um, and it is a, a guidance document, if you will, or policies for land use and transportation options, uh, specifically for areas like the South Bay, which are not transit rich. Uh, we don't have uh, light rail down here throughout the South Bay, um, like we did uh, back in the uh, in the 19th century, or yeah, in the 19th century. Wait, no, I'm getting confused. <laughs> in the 20th century, <laughs> we're in the 21st century now, right? Um, uh, so uh, we have a focus on neighborhood oriented development, uh, which is different than transit oriented development. And we've written, uh, our staff has written some white papers on this, which are really fascinating. And we are advocating for the state to actually take this uh, idea of neighborhood oriented development more seriously. Um, we haven't had much luck yet, but we are continuing to lobby and share it with, uh, with um, legislators and with um, state offices. Um, and then, of course, there is a focus here within this program on micromobility and the use of electric powered vehicles. Um, and then we also need to focus on as electric powered vehicles uh, become more and more ubiquitous, uh, we need to focus on the infrastructure that will allow them to charge. Uh, Another example is uh, our greenhouse gas reduction and climate action adaption, plan, uh, adaption planning. So we have designed this around uh, state uh, goals and laws uh, to help cities accomplish uh, GHG reduction, which is greenhouse gases. Um, what the COG did was we created climate action plans for every single city. Um, and then the cities, it's up to the cities to then adopt those climate action plans and then try to figure out how does that become a part of their um, policy making decisions going forward? How can they implement aspects of these plans that were created for them uh, going forward to make a, uh, a huge difference in uh, environmentalism and GHG reduction? Um, they're pretty in depth, as you'll see there. Uh, they include inventories for GHG and then analysis of reduction strategies. Um, they provide guides for how cities can implement strategies. And, uh, and then we have also, as a part of this, developed a South Bay Adaption Plan, which includes a sub-regional vulnerability assessment. Um, I'm, I'm adding homelessness under this idea of some examples for transportation and land use, because while we don't think of homelessness in terms of land use, we probably should, because the reality is, is that uh, it has a direct effect on the planning we need to do, especially as it relates to housing. Um, a, a perfect example would be in Redondo Beach, we have created a pallet shelter site. Um, but the site that we are that it is located on is not zoned for that use. So uh, we will need to have a land use discussion as it relates to that site. Um, and whether we do it from an emergency perspective, or we actually um, 
completely change our zoning uh, for that area, we will have to come up with a policy and, and go through a decision making process to ensure that uh, that shelter site can continue to function beyond the, the pandemic. Um, so the COG uh, works with the county. Um, we help facilitate uh, with our member cities uh, by, again, being a pass through for some Measure H funds. Uh, that includes some innovation funds that they have granted us. And then we also have worked in collaboration with some of the organizations out there like PATH or Harbor Interfaith um, to, uh, to try to provide strategies and innovative solutions to each of the cities. Uh, as, as they try to solve the crisis. Um, and then our last one, which is, uh, which is a good segue into where I'm gonna move next is the, um, the local travel network. Again, this is uh, you know, the brainchild of, of staff at, at the COG level. Um, and the idea is to promote micromobility through a, a route refinement study for use in the South Bay. So let's go into this a little bit uh, in more detail. The image on your left is, uh, is a graphical image showing you all the streets uh, and major arterials or state highways in the South Bay. Um, the green ones are, are pretty much all the residential or, or collector streets and the red ones are your, your major arterials. Uh, on the right hand side, what you see uh, is an overlay with uh, the purple lines representing streets that are um, typically in the 25 mile per hour range. Um, and we have identified them as potential slow streets where you could basically create a local travel network. And I'm, I'm gonna get into what that is specifically here. Um, what it is and what it is not. Um, the local travel network is not about um, rentals of micromobility stuff. It's not about dockless transportation or having dedicated um, rights of way on the streets. And it's not about road diets. What it is, is about consumers or, or residents having their own uh, micromobility vehicles um, or, uh, or scooters or bikes. Um, it's, uh, it is about the uh, owner being responsible for parking and it's about sharing our existing streets. So we're not creating new networks um, that are protected. We are actually using streets in a more shallow perspective. Um, and so what it is, it's more about a vehicle diet. The idea that we do not need to use um, the combustible engine vehicles, uh, the heavy duty vehicles or whatnot uh, that we currently use, that we can actually get around our neighborhoods um, to points of interest, whether they be commercial or, uh, or public, uh, by, by using a vehicle diet, by using bikes, micromobility, uh, and, and neighborhood electric vehicles. These are some of the benefits that the, the LTN can provide, right? It can help reduce GHG. Um, it can help reduce congestion. Um, most of the trips we found in the South Bay uh, are actually three miles or less round trip. And so it would satisfy 70% uh, based on our research of the trips taken in the South Bay. Um, it could contribute to more park, parking spaces being available if uh, individuals are taking alternative means to get around. Um, it could uh, establish low cost arterial congestion reduction um, and it could reduce residents costs for getting around uh, if you're not using uh, gas powered vehicles. Um, it could have implications on RENA, the Regional Housing Needs Assessment. Um, we think that it has implications to improve street safety, um, that it'll uh, help prepare the market for uh, and, and generate the possibility of rebates on e-bikes or other um, electric micromobility uh, solutions. Um, we think that it provides a new amenity for residents um, and leads to lower costs for final mile uh, food and package delivery. And of course, finally encourages growth of a green economy. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna switch my screen here. Um, let's see if I can do this uh, to show you a story map that we've created. And uh, can everybody see this here? 
Uh, that's Grace Pang right there on an electric bike. This is a, a special website, and I'll make sure I put these into the into the chat box for each of you. But this is a special website that we created at the South Bay Cog to kind of explain what it is, what is the whole thought and process behind uh, the, a local travel network. And so as you go through it, you really get to understand what is the point of it. As I said, it's about micro mobility and zero. Christian, yes, we can't see the story map. Oh, you can't. Okay. Uh, uh, do, do, do. Let me. It's climate action planning. It's on my screen. Oh, okay. Hold on. How about now? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for letting me know. Sorry. Uh, okay. So as I said, here's, here's Grace. Um, this is picture was taken somewhere in Hermosa or Manhattan, I it's believe. It's Manhattan. And don't forget, that's my husband on the scooter. Oh, we it is. That. We okay, use I that to get to the light rail station. All right. Well, I've only met him once, so good to know. Um, all right. So the LTN is about micromobility. Um, and this is a NEV that you see on the video here. They are neighborhood electric vehicles. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about them. Uh, but the idea being that the LTN services slow speed, uh, lightweight vehicles, right? For short trips, primarily short trips, okay? Um, bicycles clearly have been in the, uh, the forefront of thought for a while. And I saw Jim Hannon is on this call. Um, you know, one of the things that the cities have uh, each passed in theory is a South Bay Master Bicycle Plan. But the, uh, the unfortunate reality is that we haven't executed it. Uh, and you know that plan was passed 10 years ago by the city of Redondo Beach. And it's, a, it's really frustrating to me that we haven't um, executed on this better. And, and I'm hoping that before I leave office that we will have uh, more lanes painted throughout the city for uh, dedicated bike lanes and or sharrows. Um, but this map here shows you an idea of, of what that, that, those bike lanes should look like in the South Bay. But the reality is, is that it's not just about bikes anymore, right? The uh, micromobility is changing and it's become more than just pedal bikes as we know it. So some examples, as I just mentioned, uh, the neighborhood electric vehicle, um, speeds typically in the 25 to 30 mile per hour range. They have a, uh, they have a range of 30 to 50 miles and their costs are anywhere between 5,000 and 22,000. Um, I think you'll find most people are probably spending between five and 10,000 on these vehicles. Um, but one thing we found at the COG is that they, uh, they don't qualify sometimes for the electric vehicle, uh, incentives out there. And we are really trying to, uh, communicate to the state that they should, you know, I think if, if there was an incentive, uh, you'd see more and more people potentially uh, using these. And we do have now some, uh, some companies right here in Hermosa Beach that are selling them. Uh, so here's Grace's husband on an e-scooter. Um, looks like he was uh, built for uh, using that. Um, e-scooters uh, go typically uh, between 15 and 20 miles per hour. Uh, they have a range of 15 to 80 miles and their cost is between 400 and 3,300 dollars. E-bikes, which uh, you see Grace riding here, uh, we're seeing a lot more of these uh, in the past two or three years. Speeds usually between 20 and 25 uh, with a range of 25 to 50 miles and the cost between $1,000 and $5,000. You know, the interesting thing about these is that individuals who um, maybe have a harder time riding, especially in hilly neighborhoods and whatnot, you know, they can use an e-bike with pedal assist, you know, so they can still get exercise, but they can uh, have that additional help, you know, to, to get around and be mobile. Um, cargo e-bikes, this is just an example of a, an e-bike where uh, a family can use it. So as you see in this picture, mom and two kids, you can also use a cargo bike to do your shopping. I think, uh, I think Grace uh, uses her bike to go and do shopping locally in the neighborhood. Um, one wheels, you'll never catch me on one of these. I don't think I'm coordinated enough to try it, although it looks amazingly interesting and fun. Um, but it's another fancy version of a skateboard, I guess, with one wheel. Um, but just an example of the changes that we're seeing out there. So 
why is it relevant to the South Bay? And I think, you know, the, the prime reason is that uh, we all depend on our cars right now to get to our, uh, our jobs uh, or schools, shopping, recreation. Uh, as I just said in a meeting I had the other morning, 30% uh, of our traffic here in Redondo Beach in the mornings or um, afternoons are uh, created by individuals taking their children to school. Um, and why are they doing that? They're doing that because they primarily don't feel that it's safe for their child to walk or ride a bike to school. And all the schools are actually not very far from people's homes here in Redondo, especially the, um, the elementary schools. Um, so that's a problem, you know, and, uh, and I think this is a good example of how we can try to maybe uh, get fewer vehicles on our roads. Um, so as you see here, it says most of our trips are short trips, um, three miles or less, as I mentioned. And if you look at that, right, we're, we're, these are all the places that we typically go in a day, restaurants, pharmacies, groceries, working. Um, our cars are bigger than they need to be. Um, in many cases, uh, streets clogged with traffic. And then of course, there's the direct relationship between our travel habits and climate change. Um, so micromobility gives us an opportunity to right size our vehicles for short trips. Um, and we are as a cog really trying to work with Caltrans and, and each of the member cities into how do we improve safety and encourage the greater adoption of micromobility. And so what'll be happening over the next year is hopefully, and, and I recommend to you, if you believe that this is something that you wanna see in your city, then you should be contacting your elected representatives. I think a lot of the reasons why we haven't seen the South Bay bike master plan implemented or, uh, or we haven't seen dedicated bike lanes or whatnot is because there is a fear. Um, there isn't the political will to just implement, right? Uh, I think people are like, don't take away my car lanes. You know, they don't want to see change. And so it leads to inaction. Uh, in this case with the LTN, we don't need to take away car lanes. We're actually sharing lanes, um, but they're all through, like I said, neighborhoods. Um, so streets that have been identified as being safe uh, to ride bikes uh, or use any of these types of devices that are slow speed. Um, so hopefully we can build the political will in the coming year so that way we can effectuate this. So this is, um, this is a map of the LTN. Again, the purple lines are are connections of streets. There are some areas that are not fully connected like El Segundo here. Um, and you know, we were having a conversation about that on Friday about you know, how can we, what can El Segundo do uh, to potentially figure out a way to connect it to the rest of the network. Um, some of our peninsula cities, you know, uh, we clearly have it going up there, but, um, but it doesn't go everywhere. Uh, again, the point is these streets are meant to connect individuals from neighborhoods to areas of interest, whether that be commercial or public, uh, in a safe manner. And that's what the, uh, the amenities are here. We will, you know, as these projects come forward, uh, there's going to be, the idea would be that there would be wayfinding signs so that anybody could figure out how to get to where they want to go without thinking about it in the traditional sense of, oh, okay, I'm going to hop on this major arterial and I'm going to go to the next major arterial. These will be other ways to potentially get around. And so signage is going to be extremely important. Um, and I'm just kind of going quickly here through these, but I will put a link to this in, uh, in the uh, chat box. So the next steps to building the LTN again, like I said, if you are interested in this and you think it is uh, something worthwhile, then please contact elected officials in your city uh, and tell them that they should do it and figure out a way to, uh, to help be a part of this process going forward. Um, all right, so now let me see. I think I wanna go back to this. Okay, so uh, now we're back to just other things that the, um, that the COG does focus on. And I did mention it before, we are focused on climate action planning. Um, 
And this is a screenshot from our existing website, which will be changing soon. But this is just an overview of, of what it is we do. And if you go to the South Bay COG website, you can really get in the weeds and learn a lot about what it is we're doing for each of your individual communities. Um, from a climate action planning perspective, uh, there are uh, five milestones to, to this, uh, and I kind of touched base on it in, in uh, previous slides. But as you'll see, right, in the middle of this diagram is, is the key element, right? It's a commitment by your leadership, right? The, the COG can, can do all the research in the world and we can give all this information to the cities, but unless there is the political will to effectuate these ideas, it's not going to happen. Uh, this has been um, something that's been important to me in Redondo Beach. We've always been behind the eight ball as far as I'm concerned, especially as it compare, uh, compared to like Hermosa or Manhattan, where they actually have people on staff dedicated to um, being environmental analysts. Uh, so leadership commitment is key. So we get to our, our last brief topic here, uh, which is housing. Um, I'm sure all of you have heard, you know, we have a housing crisis. Um, some people don't believe it's necessarily a housing crisis. Um, what I believe and think it is, is it's an affordability crisis. Um, and, and that is clearly based on an enormous amount of systemic issues, uh, uh, stemming down from the federal government to the state government. Um, income inequality clearly has a ginormous effect on, on affordability. But you know, if you look at this graphic here, right, the government says affordable housing uh, or housing is affordable if a family spends no more than 30% of their income to live there. I would you know, say that you have many people in the South Bay living above and beyond their means um, because of the cost of housing here. Uh, and what we have is a dearth of truly affordable housing, workforce housing, um, permanent supportive housing for our uh, unhoused residents. Um, and so we really need to, as individual cities, be a part of the solution. I'm sure you're all hearing right now that the state has been kind of taking a heavy hand in housing legislation. And one of the reasons that they are doing that is because cities have not done enough um, or cities have taken what we would call a NIMBY approach, right? The not in my backyard approach. Um, and there is absolute truth to that. Um, there are reasons, I think sometimes why cities have not been able to make things happen, but, uh, but the, the fearful side of why is not a good reason at all. And so I think the state has taken uh, the idea and said, you know what, if you're not going to do it, we're going to figure out how to do it for you. Um, but I don't think that that's a good approach either. And so when I talk with people like Senator Ben Allen, we're constantly talking about, well, how do we find that common ground? And again, this comes back to political will. You need leaders within a city who are willing to figure out what are the right solutions towards making this happen. And, uh, and that's been my personal approach in working with Assemblymember Marisucci or Senator Allen is how can we find strategies uh, that will make a difference uh, for those individuals who need, um, who need affordable housing. And, and let's face it, folks, when people can't live in an area because they can't afford to, they now become commuters. And that commuting creates uh, issues in the transportation sector and the congestion on our roads. So um, this past year, I was um, honored to, uh, to curate uh, the South Bay Cogs General Assembly. And the topic of that General Assembly was intersections. And it's because in my six years here in office, what I've noticed is that when we talk about housing, we are also talking about transportation and we are talking about the environment and we are talking about homelessness and that economic development. All these areas um, intersect with each other and have both intended and unintended consequences 
on each of the areas when you make a shift in, in one policy or another. And so it's important for elected leaders, for uh, organizations like the COG or SCAG to think about the integration, how all these things intersect and co-relate to each other. And when we do that, then maybe we can actually create forward thinking um, policies that will have an impact uh, on our future as it relates back to the regional transportation planning, right? What is that going to? What is it going to look like in 2045 when this RTP comes to an end and they're coming up with the next one? So I thank you. I apologize for uh, for that taking as as long as it did. It was, as I said, an enormous amount of information, but uh, but we do uh, we can open it up to questions. And again, thank you so much for, uh, for listening and your time today. Chris, that was overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> that was so much information. Um, and I think the complexity of the uh, people that are involved in trying to solve these problems and the levels of different committees. And one of my questions was, how many permanent staff people do you have for the COG and how much um, on um, the, the uh, Southern California area of governments? How many, how many permanent um, jobs are there in yes, these yes, organizations? Yes. SCAG is a is a much bigger organization, uh, and I don't know they they have a, a lot of staff at, at SCAG. Um, I don't know how many at the COG level. I want to say uh, staff wise, we have somewhere between maybe fifteen and twenty two individuals on staff in, in a variety of different capacities. And if Jackie is still on and wants to, uh, she probably has the exact number. Um, but, about twelve. Uh, about twelve. So there you go. About I was. Yeah. So, so, but those 12 people function like 15 to 22 people. That's the amount of work output that they put. So um, Jackie really has put together um, a great team there and they do a lot with a little. So we have had several questions um, on the, and, and in, in different areas too. So, but one of the concerns on the, e-bikes and the um, travel lanes is the safety issue of e-bikes going too fast and the concern of uh, just drivers going around the e-bikes. And it's probably true of scooters and the other forms of transportation as well. Yeah. Uh, well, I think it's a, it's a valid concern, right? And uh, a program that I created here in uh, Redondo, which has now uh, grown to go into um, Hermosa and Manhattan in partnership with the Beach City Health District, um, is called Streets for All. And I think to the point of your question, there always needs to be an educational component. Um, when you create um, a sharrow, right, or a shared system where both vehicles and, and, and slow speed vehicles are going to be, you have to educate people that um, what does what does the paint on the ground mean? What does that sharrow mean? And, and so you have to educate drivers to be aware that the streets are not just for them. It is not just for cars. It is for everybody. Um, and if we can get people to drive slower, the whole point of this network being on residential streets is that you can only go a certain speed, even if you're on an e-bike, right? Um, and ideally, you would hope that people driving vehicles are also driving within the speed limit. So um, there will have to be an educational component, I think, towards, um, towards effectuating the LTN. Um, but we, we really need to do that anyways, because um, that's why I created Streets for All, because people are just driving too damn fast all the time. You know, they're always in a rush. Another question was, someone would like to see bike and car share in South Bay. How do we encourage Metro bike share to extend into the South Bay? Yeah, um, you know, we have, we've, we've done, the COG actually did a pilot project where with a car share uh, program uh, right around the time, I think, that I was coming uh, on board. 
um, which uh, has came to an end. It didn't really work. Um, not to say that it can't work. Um, we as a COG still believe that there is an opportunity for uh, car share or bike share, especially with uh, multi-housing units, and that uh, they can be a, um, a place like a, a, a starting and ending place for uh, shared vehicles. Um, Metro has uh, explored doing bike share. Um, they haven't explored it really here in the South Bay. And I think that's primarily because we don't have as much transit. You see it a lot in Long Beach or downtown LA. Um, some of the scooter, um, the private scooter companies have explored like scooter sharing programs. And those have also been a little bit disastrous. So I think we're, we're still trying to figure out how shared programs can work uh, and whether that is um, a system that is wholly owned by like Metro or a private entity. Um, the, the point of the LTN though, I think is that we see more and more individuals, homeowners, you know, residents wanting to own their own um, bikes, uh, electric bikes, scooters and whatnot and using those. And so it, uh, that's where we see it going. And in that case, then you just need to have some infrastructure set up for, well, how can that person park that bike or, or that scooter or whatnot for when, when they go to certain places? So another comment was, is that, uh, let's see, I think safe bike infrastructure, paren, pro protect, protected sidewalk level lanes for bike, should take precedence so that safety is built into the system for riders and drivers. A comment on that? Um, well, I couldn't agree more. I actually, I uh, take the LTN out of this. I really have been an advocate. I would love to see more class one bike lanes or class four bike lanes throughout the South Bay, which, which is a protected lane. Um, and, and that would not be on the sidewalk. A lot of cities actually technically don't allow cyclists to be on the sidewalk, but I'll tell you that if my kids are riding their bikes, I want them on the sidewalk because they're gonna be safer than in the street. Um, now, as they become better and better at riding bikes, you know, I, I'll have to trust their judgment, but you know, to, to have a class one bike lane, like the way we do down uh, on Harbor Drive, in, um, in Redondo, which connects then to the, uh, both the Esplanade on the south side and, and the, uh, the, the boardwalk in Hermosa, Manhattan. Like having a protected bike lane makes all the difference in the world. And I think if you build it, they will come. If we have protected bike lanes, especially on major arterials, uh, you will, I think you will see more and more people say, hey, it's safer for me to ride my bike and I'm going to do it because I can't. Uh, so th that, that would be my personal goal. A question that always comes up is the impact on parking in, um, and I guess for both housing and for uh, commercial areas, what's the impact and how, how do you retain enough <laughs> parking for all the cars that are going? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Parking, um, there's there's advocates on both sides of this, this equation or argument, if you will, right? In some cases, I think cities um, within their municipal codes are probably over parking um, and, and have uh, very, very restrictive guidelines, which then make it hard for uh, people wanting to invest, especially in the commercial space, um, in, in an area because they, they can't meet the parking requirements. Um, 